about the legacy. Please see any of the residents wearing their name tags. Um, there is always a party here, like tonight. So thank you again and welcome. Well, 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 well that, that was that was okay. I mean, I got that, but it's like. Okay. But it was just getting onto it. Well, I'm going to introduce uh, myself. My name is Jeanette the, Pincus, the, and I'm just finishing my first year officially as president. But I want to tell you, Stuart Rosenfeld is coming up now, and this, this is his seventh year unofficially as president. So thank you. Come on up. We've got a special um, tribute. Uh, we lost um, our dear executive director, Deborah Polsky, right. just in the past couple months, and we wanted to um, share some things with you. So this is about this is the point in the uh, annual meeting we have a, where we would. That was kid. Can you cut the mic? I can't compete with Brad Sham. It's just not going to happen. All right, we good? So. As I was saying, uh, this is the point in the annual meeting where we could see our executive director for the past 11 plus years, Deborah Polsky, get up and talk about all the programs and advances of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society of the past year. If she were here, she would talk with passion about the sold out bus rides through old Jewish South Dallas or the tour of the Blue House. She would talk about the well attended Judaica and Mosaic art workshops and the impact they had on attendees. She would mention the outreach effort of at Anshay Torah, where we now have a beautiful display case showcasing our archives, and we'll soon have one at Sheriff Israel and other locations. She would then talk about our initiative where we got oral histories from every living Dallas Federation president. She would talk about our discussions with the JCC on future office expansion plans. Finally, her passion would turn to pride as she would talk about the great work and dedication of her longtime staff, Jenny and Jessica. A true professional, she would never talk about herself at these annual meetings. She wouldn't talk about her two-year battle with breast cancer, which she beat, or other surgeries or health issues that would often slow her down but never stop her from performing her duties. She wouldn't mention the difficulties in continuing our programs during the pandemic, Instead, talking about how she quickly shifted to online programs that were as well attended as some of our pre-pandemic in-person events. She wouldn't mention that it was her who spent many hours applying for and receiving multiple grants and PPP loans that kept us afloat during a time when most nonprofits financially suffered. The only thing we could count on was Deborah mentioning her love for the agency, her job, her staff, her religion, and the Dallas Jewish community, which was her family. In keeping with our sports theme speakers tonight, Deborah didn't have the physical appearance of a Jordan, Brady, Jeter, or Gretzky, but she shared many of the same qualities. Dedication to her craft, longevity, determination in the face of adversity, and immense love of the game and the people she played with. Like these Hall of Famers, Deborah's work as executive director changed the game for her organization, setting a high bar for those who would come after her and creating the trajectory for her future success. While she may no longer be with us, we can keep her memory alive by continuing to support the Dallas Jewish Historical Society and many other Jewish organizations she immersed herself in over a 40 plus year nonprofit career. She was a true all star, and we dedicate this annual meeting to her memory. Thank you. We also have to say, people very dear to her and to our organization we've also lost this year. David Jenikov, Ruth Andrus, Andy Jacobs, and Rini Stanley, they were very supportive um, of our organization through the years, um, active, and, and helped us support many of the programs that we had, and we're thinking of them too. Um, to begin with, I wanted to share what our mission is. Uh, we're here to preserve and protect collections of written, visual, and audible materials that document the history of the Dallas Jewish community and to make these materials available to the public and researchers and to keep the past as a living legacy for our community. Our vision is to help present and future generations connect with Jewish Dallas. What we are trying to do is to bring things to all ages and we know we're a small agency with a very big mission 
It was very important for us, as you know, we're home at the JCC, and we've been there all 52 years. What was very exciting for us this year is that with Marcy Helfand's help, and then Artie Allen, and Joe Lee uh, Newman, and David Friedman, that we got our sign up, our signage right by the flagpole. So we're officially there, everyone can see us, and that was wonderful. The JCC is home to us, and we want to stay there. And we know the JCC is also in the process of um, a b building, and we want to still be in there. It's so important for us to be with all the generations um, of the Jewish community. We also know that we need to grow. Um, the, as the community has grown, as you can imagine, that 50 years, how much um, we need to be growing, and we have a staff of two and a half, and all of us, the rest of it's the volunteers. So what we've been trying to do this year is show a lot of programs every month with something that would be for everyone in the community, and we hope that you've seen that. Texas Jewish Post has been wonderful uh, to us by helping us put ads um, in their newspaper and supporting us so much. So I wanted to thank them so much for that. Also, the Jewish Federation has been so helpful with us, with helping us with grants and um, programs that we've been doing. Uh, I wanted to also mention, um, is Manette Rose Klein here? Okay, she's the one of the beginning of, there was 10 individuals that met and decided to form this organization. She showed me, she's got the $10 that everyone signed, and um, it's the earnest money for the program. It's such a special thing that um, we're going to have that from her, and um, I wanted to thank her for that, too. Also, I wanted to thank um, Eric Goldberg, who's now the president of Jewish um, Family Service. He came through us through Waldman Brothers. Um, we were very um, anxious to... Um, be able to share the archives that we have, we store them in, in a temperature controlled vault um, in our office. But as you can imagine, with all the individuals, organiza organizations, and synagogues and temples that were gathering quite a bit. So we have to have a second storage unit um, off our campus. And so we know that we also need to be growing, and we want to take the things that are very important to people and have them. Eric was able to help us that now, as Stuart had mentioned, and you're also going to hear from Jessica, is that we're starting to share them in synagogues um, at, and at the JCC. They allowed us to take all the glass displays that are down the hall from us, so we're able to um, share some special programs with that. Okay, next what I would like to do is call up um, Jessica Schneider-Adams, our archivist and volunteer coordinator. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, as Jeanette mentioned, I'm Jessica Schneider-Adams. I am the archivist and volunteer coordinator for DJHS. I've been with the organization for five years now. Now, I'm here to share with you about our archive and how it relates to our mission, as well as our renewed and ongoing efforts related to community outreach and our goals for future growth. I want to start by sharing some of our archive-related stats for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. In the last year, we have recorded 58 oral history interviews, 12 of which were addendums or additions to existing interviews in our collection. And that is part of our 770 total interviews that are in the archive recorded since 1971. 12 transcripts were completed, and nearly that many, old and new, were added to our online database and access was improved by taking key terms and phrases and identifying where in each interview those topics were discussed. So in that way, we're assisting researchers and the public with topics of interest. One major collection was processed, which I'll also talk about more in just a little while, the Rini Stanley collection. Uh, one additional large collection and finding aid were completed. That is the Can family collection, which is attached to Ruth Can, one of the original 10 that Jeanette mentioned. 
Nearly 500 photos were digitized, many uploaded into our online database as well. Over 600 records were added to our collection database eloquent systems to improve public access to our holdings. And over 100 assets were photographed for internal documentation. 30 volunteers joined us in varying capacities in the last year, and 20 of those have been trained to conduct oral history interviews, which is our flagship program. Um, for program, programs, exhibits, and other miscellaneous things, we have seven exhibits that have gone on display in the last year. And that is substantially more than in years past because we were making up for years not having them um, during the pandemic. They were called It's All Fun and Games, about sports played and celebrated in the Dallas Jewish community. Then and now, South Dallas, which looks at the juxtaposition of what South Dallas used to look like when it was a major Jewish community compared to what it looks like today. And that one's available on our website. Please go look at it. Uh, Devotion Illuminated, Life Guided by Light in Jewish Dallas. That was centered mostly on our wonderful, beautiful collection of menorahs and Hanukkah. On Shea Torah's display, which focuses on member families and their connections to the community. And We Are Jewish Dallas, which is on display at the JCC right now, um, showing multiple generations of how Jews have impacted um, the growth of Dallas. Women's Philanthropy in the Jewish Community, which is both a virtual um, interactive exhibit. I highly encourage you to go to our website and look at that as well. And, and there is a version of it on display at the JCC. And finally, our current exhibit in front of the office is called Feel the Rhythm, Music Performance and Appreciation in Jewish Dallas. We conducted three bus tours, one for our board of directors and two for Legacy Midtown Park. Um, we conducted three oral history programs where I talk about the importance and the ease of participating in our oral history program, both here and at Legacy Willow Bend. And there were also three oral history trainings, which is why we now have 20 wonderful interviewers ready to record your oral history. Now I will share a little bit more about our mission and our goals for the future. Jeanette shared our mission and she shared our vision. And one way we encompass both of those is by bringing our archive out into the community through displays and exhibitions. We have three permanent cases outside in our offices at the JCC where displays rotate throughout the year. This past year, we have been fortunate to have temporary use of two additional hallway display cases near our office. We also strive to display our collections beyond the walls of the J through ongoing and rotating virtual exhibitions available via our, our website, djhs.org, and community displays. Currently, we have an exhibit at Congregation on Shea Torah, which I mentioned, that will be up through December of this year, and next week I'm going in to rotate some, uh, some of the pieces, and so it will be changing and new and fresh, so please go look at that one too. And other congregations have also shown interest, as both Stuart and Jeanette mentioned as well. We're hoping to have one up at Sherith by the high holidays, and there'll be three different locations of displays there, and that one will be really exciting too. Referring back to our vision statement, each of you sitting here with us this evening or watching from your homes are part of this present. You are the Dallas Jewish community. It is your past, your present and your future that we strive to preserve daily through our archival practices, community initiatives, and programs. I encourage each and every one of you to evaluate your home collections, your files related to activities from your youth, your education, profession, volunteerism, community engagement, and other activities to see what may be appropriate to donate to DJHS. They may seem like a, this may seem like a monumental task, and sometimes it is but we're here to help. Grab a donation guide on your way out or call or email me to set an appointment to assess your collection. We want your stuff, we really do. Maybe not all of it, but the bits and pieces that define your legacy, <laughs> that represent the community as a whole, the pieces that help us shape and share the narrative of this vibrant, thriving, influential, and diverse Jewish community. We gather what we can on our own, but our collections and records will be more complete with your help. Do you regularly attend community events like this one, uh, meetings or programs? Do you happen to snap any photos or grab that program or other memento? Make arrangements with us to donate them to DJHS. If you want to hold on to the originals, we will gladly scan or photograph the, the materials and return them to you. With that said, it stands to reason that we are also in need of physical growth within our archive. 
We have been in our location at the JCC since our inception in 1971. Our current office space was dis our current office space was designed over a decade ago, and we are bursting at the seams. I'm exaggerating only slightly. Uh, our holdings are safely housed in your climate-controlled vault, but in order to continue growing at the same pace we have for over 50 years, we are going to need to increase the footprint of our vault and, of course, our workspace to meet demand and usher DJHS into our next era. If anything I have shared resonates with you today, please keep DJHS in mind when organizing your planned giving. We are here to answer any questions you may have with that process. There's a lot to look forward to, as others have mentioned. We have another oral history training coming up in July, Sheriff Israel and Teferit Israel Community Displays, a home preservation workshop I am running with Felicia Williamson, the archivist at the Holocaust Center, the bus tour with Adot Havarim, a date yet to be decided, a mosaic workshop with Jamie Pink, likely in November, and the second rendition of our Judaica Roadshow, likely in January. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here today and for joining us on this journey as we continue bringing you wonderful programs. We really appreciate your participation and your involvement in the community. Oh. Yes, thank you so much. Jeanette reminded me of a very important, very special part of our program. So if Ms. Brett Stanley and Mr. David Stanley could join me up here, please. Gonna get emotional because it's so special. So Rini, several years ago, donated a large part of her collection to us, knowing that she could trust us to take care of it. She did want one of her scrapbooks returned, and we were able to reformat it in a archival preserved um, a scrapbook um, cover. So in perpetuity, Rini's memories from her time with NCJW will be preserved in a way that will keep them around much longer than how they were originally stored. We are also returning items that she wished to have returned, which some photos from a Lions of Judea um, Israel mission back in the early 2000s, as well as some other materials. Um, and so we are, would like to give these back to Rini, um, to you on Rini's behalf. Um, just so you all can have them in her memory. And now I welcome Melissa Ackerman to talk about our oral history project. Thank you. I was asked to speak just for a few minutes to tell you a little bit about some of the projects and initiatives we completed this past year and some of the exciting things that are coming up next year. Um, I agreed to chair this committee before I'd even conducted an interview. And I have to tell you, it has been the most interesting thing I've done in a long time. Hearing people's history and have them talk about how they grew up, where they grew up, how they got to the point they are today is just fascinating. And um, some of the projects and initiatives we completed this year, we were able to interview all the Federation past presidents, including Buddy Rosenthal of Blessed Memory. And um, we sat down with each of them and they talked about their time that they served and the community and what it was like when they served and how things have changed. We offered um, Legacy Midtown Park Oral History Days where we conducted 11 interviews over a two-day period, including several people in assisted living. We plan to continue that both here and at Willow Bend because it was really successful and it was a, a good way to get a lot of interviews in a short period of time. Um, some of the projects and initiatives in the coming year are to tackle the existing interest list, which um, we really want to get to the Jewish war veterans, the Russian Jewish community, 
And we have a meeting set, uh, set up next week with Laura Seymour to discuss some type of program involving children and oral histories and see if we can come up with something creative that's, that hasn't been done before. So we'll keep you posted on that. Don't know what age, don't, don't know anything about it yet, but we're, we're gonna brainstorm and it's, I'm sure it'll be wonderful. And just yesterday, we secured the permission to do all of the JCC past presidents, and it's a new project that we're gonna do. I see several of you in this room that we will be contacting over the next few months to get uh, your take on the time that you served and what the community was like and some of the exciting things that the center did while you were um, on the board. So we look forward to, ha to that, and hopefully by next year at this meeting, we will have completed that and have a whole lot more exciting stories to tell. Um, as always, we need more interviewers, and there are opportunities to train with Jessica. She's doing one in July, and um, there are opportunities to shadow existing interviews. We have a lot on our plate, so we need a lot more people, and it's really a, a wonderful way to spend your time. You can do it on your own time, according to your own schedule, and uh, we need you, all of you in here, to agree to be interviewed. Everyone has a story. You may think you don't, but everybody has a story to tell. And so please um, let us talk to you and preserve your history so that your children and grandchildren will have it here and easy to access. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to call up Melissa Pricer, who's our interim executive director. Hello. Um, so I first met Deborah and got to know the Dallas Jewish Historical Society when I was executive director of Dallas Heritage Village at Old City Park. Some of you may remember we worked together on an exhibit in 2017 called Neighborhoods We Called Home. Um, I was also, and you know, Deborah and I became friends during that. I was also involved in the rescue of the Blue House. I'm the one that made the first phone call that started that whole thing, um, for better or for worse. And I think it's for better because it's really looking lovely. Um, so about two years ago, I became a consultant, and so Deborah reached out to me a while ago and said, could you come help get some things going, um, kind of juice up some stuff related to fundraising? And so I started working with the Jewish Historical Society in February, and then of course we all know what happened. Um, and since I was here and already knew the organization and some of the key people, um, the board asked me to step in as interim and kind of keep things going because we know it's gonna take a little while to find the right next person. So my goals for this period, they're not, they're not huge, they're not overwhelming, but really it's to support the board and the staff and the members as we work through all of this because when somebody leaves us suddenly there's always questions and right now I'm digging through things trying to answer some of those questions. Um, I'm going to tackle a few projects that hopefully will help whoever the next executive director is really hit the ground running strong um, and you know with my experience as a director I can kind of see where things need to go and keep going. So the other thing too is there's still that f some fundraising goals that we set when I was first hired as a consultant. So we will be doing some things relating to fundraising, trying to make sure that the database is in beautiful shape because I am quickly learning that all of y'all are related. <laughs> and that's not necessarily reflected in the database because all of that information was in Deborah's head, which is great for Deborah but it's not so great for those of us that come after. And so one of the goals I have is start getting some of those relationships in the database. So whether or not the person who's next in that office is familiar with the Dallas Jewish community or not, they'll be able to get to know you and know who, whose cousin is who and who's talking to whom and who's not talking to whom and all of that good stuff. So we will be in touch. I've, I've been officially interim for three weeks maybe, so I still don't know much at all, um, but I'm, I look forward to getting to know all of you better. I'm happy to answer any questions, 
chit chat about whatever. It's been a real pleasure to work with Jeanette and Jenny and Jessica and just keep things going so this organization doesn't lose any of the ground that it's made over the last several years during this gap in leadership. So thank you so much for welcoming me and explaining to me various words in Yiddish um, because I'm, I'm not Jewish. I think you probably knew that because I'm not related to any of you. Um, <laughs> So thank you for your help and teaching me. Um, I did read the All of a Kind family books quite often as a child, so I do feel like I know a tiny bit more than the average Methodist. Um, but I'm learning a lot, and thank you, and it's been a pleasure to be welcomed so warmly by your community. I look forward to working with you for as long as I need to work with you. Okay, Jenny, our administrative assistant, I'd like you to come up. And also Chip Muchin, our treasurer, and Joe Reingold, our secretary, and our Dallas Jewish Community F uh, Foundation unsung hero, our volunteer of the year. <clears throat> I'm not going to get through this very well. I'm not going to get through this easily. So, um... I've, I've come to know Jenny quite well, and many of you have too. This is Jenny Clays's last official event as our administrative assistant, but she has been so much more to all of us. We really value your skills, your artistic abilities, your talents, your loyalty above all to our organization for the last eight years. We know it hasn't always been easy, but we hope that it's been rewarding for you. It certainly has been for us. And of course, we wish you much success and best wishes in your new venture, whatever that may be. Please come back and see us anytime. We will really, really miss you. I definitely second uh, what Joe said right from the heart here. And to show our appreciation to Jenny, we've gotten you a gift here. And perhaps you want to open it now and show everybody what you got. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to embarrass you. <laughs> All right. But anyway. It's timely because um, the the artist just died, and you're probably familiar with Gary Rosenthal, so it's a Gary Rosenthal piece, and it's Shabbat candles, and it's also an artsy-fartsy kind of piece that Jenny should like. <laughs> Okay, since we were talking, I saw Minette Rose Klein walk in. So I want her to stand up. She's the original, as I had mentioned, that started our organization. I want her to give you a hand. There you are. <laughs> but thank you. It's wonderful to have you. I want to also uh, acknowledge the special funds that we have that ha uh, families have put in um, for organization. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the Ginger Chesnick Jacobs Historical Tour and Outreach Fund. And that was in memory um, of, our, of the founder of our organization, uh, Ginger Jacobs. And this donation provides funding to support guided tours of meaningful places and historical interest in the greater Dallas Jewish community. Um, to help support outreach activities, engage, educate, and share the cultural history of, of Jewish Dallas. This past year, I, we had 16 new board members join us. So um, what we did is we invited the board to come for them to see this one. And then, we, as you had heard, we did it through Legacy. Um, we did some tours with them. Also this year, we have trained, and we have four other people also that can... Um, do the tour. So we're planning on really being busy this year and getting some more community tours back going because I know everyone enjoys it so much. And we especially enjoy having those on the bus with us that have lived there and have the stories or they know things from their parents, grandparents, great grandparents. It's just wonderful um, to see that. The um, we have Mark Jacobs here uh, from the family, and I want to acknowledge him. He's also a past president um, of organization. Mark, where are you? 
Marcia, there you are. Okay, there you are. <laughs> there. Thank you so much. We appreciate your continued support for that. The next is the next Naxon Family Project Fund. This was in memory of William Naxon, who was a Dallas Jewish Historical Society supporter. And this provides funding that's special for films, author events, lectures, exhibits, and other programs and projects, also to educate and enrich the lives of our membership here. Um, Elia Naxon has, um, is a life member for us, and also I believe she's not here, but her son Adam, are you here? Thank you, Adam, thank you, and, and sons, is that right? Thank you so much, we appreciate it. Um, when we've done the film fest with the JCC, my, many of you will notice that you'll see the Naxon Family Fund's name on that. Um, also, we've had the Jim Schwartz Annual Lecture Series Fund, and this was established for past president of Jim Schwartz. Um, this provides support of our annual lecture series that you'll, you've seen his face and name on a lot of the, a lot of the things that we've done this past year. This has been um, supported by anonymous donor for the, for the past several years, and we appreciate it so much um, that that was done for us. We had a program in April to uh, celebrate the life and times of Jimmy Schwartz, and um, it was a wonderful thing, and we actually did raise some money to, to go into that lecture series, so we're really appreciative of everyone that supported that for us. Another special fund we have is that Jessica had mentioned, and Melissa, is our oral history archive fund, and this began in the 1970s, and I believe she told you the number. We're close to 800. It's just amazing what we can do, and we've gotten so many interviewers, and we just we want to do as many, many as we can. Sam Feldman um, and his family created a permanent fund for us, so this is something that we can continue to do. And I don't is is this Sam come tonight? Okay, but well, we want to appreciate and say thank you to the family also. Um, Jessica mentioned the Blue House Documentary Fund. We were, and so did Melissa, uh, we um, got to take a, a tour of the Blue House, I believe in January with Preservation Dallas. Mark Birnbaum, who's a local filmmaker that you might know, has been in the process and almost finishing a full-length documentary about um, the um, people that lived in the home and, and the preservation of it. So we want to thank you so much for that. Also, what I want to um, say is Zane Bellier. If I said his name right, where are you? Thank you. He gave us a wonderful donation. It happened during the COVID time, and it really helped sustain us with our programming and, and keep us going to during that time. So we want to thank you so much and acknowledge that. We got to also... Um, he's with Dallas Jewish Funeral Homes, and we had a wonderful program. It was one of the last ones that Deborah actually was with us at, and Michael Cohen and Avi Mitzner from Sheriff Israel. It was called Ethical Wills, and it was with the JCC seniors, and it was just a really fun, fun, great program. So thank you so much for that. I also want to acknowledge... We appreciate your membership so much. As I mentioned before, all the programming we did this year was free of charge. And we did that because we wanted everyone to come and to, and to uh, experience things that have to do with um, our history. Uh, we want your membership. And hopefully you, you'll be seeing all the things that we're doing that you'll feel like it's something special that you can be part of us to do that. We also want to acknowledge our trailblazers. That is, you, there was a, a list up there. It's for $500 and up that we um, appreciate so much that you've done this for us. Um, next, I would like to call up Reuben Davidson, who's our member at large, and We've liked him so much, so we made a position for him <laughs> so he could be in our executive board. Thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. So, good evening. Jeanette gave me the honor of sharing some very exciting news. Um, the city has approved a historical marker um, at Harry Hines Triangle Park. Um, it's supposed to get approved or final approval today at the park board meeting. Um, you know, DJHS applied for this marker in conjunction with the Dallas Mexican American Historical League and the first Mexican Baptist Church back in 2008. And this was really spearheaded by Deborah, who was extremely persistent in making this happen. 
Um, the historical marker commem commemorates the location of the Anche Sfard Synagogue, and just a couple of excerpts from the um, marker read as follows. Um, because of the religious persecution in Russia and Eastern Europe, Jewish people immigrated to the United States in large numbers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Galveston Plan was des designed to divert immigrants away from East Coast cities because they were overly crowded and brought many Jewish immigrants to Texas. Many came to the area surrounding Pike Park because of the affordable housing and the neighborhood was actually named Little, Little Jerusalem. In 1906, the community founded the congregation and um, in 1913, it actually started operating as a synagogue. And then in 1915, because the Jewish community was prospering, the middle class began to relocate to homes in South Dallas. At the same time, Mexicans started to come and flee the Mexican Revolution and came to the same area, which later changed the name from Little Jerusalem to Little Mexico. When the Jewish congregation moved to, the new lo to its new location in South Dallas, it actually sold the synagogue to the first Mexican Baptist church in 1918. Although the house at, on Alamo Street no longer exists, um, the, the synagogue and the First Mexico Baptist Church symbolize, symbolizes Dallas's legacy as a multicultural hub in the 20th century and beyond, a real testament to um, our community in the city of Dallas. I'm excited to share this information, and um, really, you know, Deborah of blessed memory, we appreciate all of her hard work in making this happen. So we are going to find out there's a date that we actually can come and get that marker in the ground. So it's going to be fabulous, and we'll let you all know that. Uh, next, I'd like to bring up uh, Robin ravinsky Mursky and Bonnie Whitman to tell you about an event that we've got coming up that's really special, our Aunt Socorro Humanitarian Award. Okay, I'll start. Hi, welcome. I am Robin ravinsky Mursky, and I am proud co-chair of this year's uh, Anne Loeb Secor Humanitarian Award that we are giving to three amazing, amazing women. We are honoring Jerry Finkelstein, Liz Lehner, and Marilyn Paylette. We, I was asked um, by Stephanie uh, Siegel Balin, who is the co other co-chair, who couldn't be here tonight because she had to stay in Italy. She, she's in Italy. Oh my goodness. So, otherwise she she would be here, but she asked me to be her co-chair, and um, I I said yes, and because of we are honoring these wonderful women, and plus the people I get to work with. And it is amazing. So um, a little bit about each person is Jerry, as you know, has um, been involved with Dallas Kosher, the VOD, as executive director in 1995. She keeps us all in line and makes sure everything is kosher. She is a third generation. <laughs> no, no one said tacos, yeah. Okay. <laughs> A third-generation Dallasite, and her husband, Bill, who is currently chairman of the board of the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas. I love Jerry. I've worked with her. I've known her being born and raised in Dallas, and um, she is so well-deserving of this award. Our next um, honoree, Liz Lehner. I had the pleasure of actually um, being a parent with Liz, and our kids went to school together. She was part of um, the PTA at Akiba. She also has um, been an author. She published an, a memoir of Marcus Rosenberg, and it's called Marcus, Planter of Trees. And um, Marcus Rosenberg is a Holocaust survivor, and if you haven't read it, I 
definitely suggest you do. It's amazing. And then we have Marilyn Paylette, and Marilyn is here tonight. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you are. Can you just take that? Oh, Jerry, where? I didn't see you. Hey. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Marilyn was um, born in Dallas, and she's one of the Bedrock Jewish families. Um, her parents, the beloved Francis and Irvin Donsky, <coughs> sorry, founders of everyone's favorite store, Sterling's. I remember when I was younger, yeah, yay, Sterling's. I would love to go to Sterling's. Um, Marilyn is also um, a realtor. She is in her 30th year with Abby Holiday, and um, she has been uh, honored several times by D Magazine as the best real estate agent and most recently was awarded 2022 Texas Monthly Best Realtors and 2022 D Magazine Best Realtors. And she also provided a very safe place for me and her boys to go out playing with when we were younger. <laughs> so, totally remember that. Where did you go out playing? <laughs> well, if y'all would like to know that, we have an event for you to come to. Yes. We, the event is called Born to Rock. And what we are doing is we are having dinner, open bar, dancing, silent auction, and um, we have a band coming. It's the cover band, the Stoneleys, and they sound exactly like the Rolling Stones. Oh. So this is going to be a party that you don't want to miss. There are several ways you can help. And um, all the money goes back into the Jewish Historical Society. And um, Bonnie will talk about, yeah. Bonnie's our chair, yeah, of the sponsorship. So I'm going to let her talk to you about sponsors. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm standing on this. Which is a piece of Jewish his yes. Historical Society. Right yes. There. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is what it's like to be this tall. Anyway, um, so glad, I'm Bonnie Whitman, and I'm so glad to be here and with all of you, and also looking, oh, you can't hear me, looking forward, you can't, actually, that's not a problem, <laughs> and looking forward to honoring those three wonderful women who Robin just mentioned. Um, at your seats, you probably did get, or as you came in, something about Born to Rock, so you'll have all the information of when it's going to be, September 28th, mark that on your calendars, um, at, at Temple Emmanuel, and it is our fundraiser. And so all these wonderful things that have been mentioned tonight will be due to some of the fundraising that we'll be doing. And I have the privilege of being head of uh, chairing the sponsorship and host tables. So I expect every single one of you here tonight to sign up to either go to the event, to sponsor the event, to be a part of the event, because it really does show our appreciation, one for the women, one for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And it means so much to me that I brought my husband here tonight. We're celebrating our 43rd anniversary tonight. And it was... <laughs> Thank you. So I would hope I can tell you some of the people who have already committed to um, being sponsors, one being our president, Jeanette, and her lovely husband uh, is a sponsor. I don't know if you want me to tell you at the amount or that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Good, <laughs> good, good. I wasn't planning on doing that. A million we have yes. We have several of our board members who have already um, have already pledged that they would be sponsors in a certain level. And again, in honor of my anniversary, forty third, I and my husband Jeffrey will be sponsors of this wonderful event. And so please, please consider the sponsorships. They will, I think there is something out on the table about the sponsorships. There is. Okay, tell me. And the website <laughs> will go live as soon as possible. We tried to make it easy mm -hmm. and um, have a QR code that right. you can just scan. And um, it also has the levels on this. Mm -hmm, will be up. Um, many of you will be getting letters from me. Uh, asking you the same thing about being considered being a sponsor, so I sure hope that you will know who it is that's sending you that letter. And um, I think, oh, and as a sponsorships, 
uh, the sooner you pledge your sponsorship, it will be collated and be on our invitation that will be coming out for the event. Right. And um, just to say a little bit also, if Please. you want to help in other ways besides being a sponsor, <laughs> definitely show up. And also there are auction forms. If you'd like to get us something for our auction, yes. please donate something for our auction. And also the, um, the chairs that we have are amazing. And it's, I just wanna say, one of the reasons why I took this position was also because I've never done um, fundraising or anything with Deuce uh, Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And, um, but, so Stephanie and I are co-chairs. Bonnie Whitman is um, in charge of sponsored. And Nancy Stanley has agreed to do our invitation design. Our auction co-chairs, Joey Daniel and Janet Martin. And um, we're doing a wine pool, which is Valerie Murray. Our decorations co-chair, Pam Pigeon and Lori Prangler, volunteer chair. So if anyone wants to volunteer for something big or even the littlest thing, please help is Melissa Ackerman. And on de working decorations is um, also Susie Schwartz. And um, our liaison is Ellen Ungerman and of course, Jeanette Pincus. So please, please, please come help us and it'll be worth every cent and you'll have a blast. I promise. Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Okay, next, Lori Prangler, our incoming second vice president. Okay, this, this is gonna be quick. Um, anyway, we're so excited to tell you all about the programs that we are doing, starting with the South Dallas bus tour on June 22nd, Cousins Club, Mosaic Workshop with Jamie Pink, Our History of Keeping Kosher, Judaica Rocho, again with Beth Tora Sisterhood presentation, workshop with the Dallas Holocaust Museum and working on projects with um, high residents. Okay. Okay, now I'd like to recognize um, those board members that are gonna be leaving us this year. Uh, Robin Donsky, who's been with us, I think as long as me, said four years. Howard Free, that was with us this past year. David Goldman, that's been with us over 10 years. Mark Richman, who had to move to Memphis. We had him for one year. And I'd like to call up Ellen Ungerman. Uh, she's been with us, would you say it's 11 years? And this, for, she's very special because she was my junior, junior counselor at the JCC, and she became my mentor as I joined here. So I just wanted to acknowledge oh, her very best. much. So You're thank you. Thank you. This is the best. Uh, and then the thing is also is that you should know, as Liz Lehner knows and Fonda Arbetter will tell you, that you really don't leave us. We still, I still call you and you're, you still do things for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, joining our board this year is going to be Bobby Goodman, Susie Schwartz, Hillary Stern, and Bonnie Whitman. So I'm going to ca be calling um, all the uh, board members that we have now so I can like reinstall you for our 2023-2024 board. But before I do that, I've been having such a good time. When I've been meeting people I didn't know. Who of y'all, who has been passed on our board? I'd like you to stand and recognize you because there were quite a few, but it was so special that you were here. So any of you that have been, that served on the Dallas Jewish Historical Society board, please stand. As I, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now my new, uh, the board, now, as I say your name, please stand. Rhonda Duchin, 
Lori Prangler, Chip Muchin, Joe Reingold, Mitch Myers, Ruben Davidson, Stuart Rosenfeld. Are you standing? Okay, good. Uh, Melissa Ackerman, Roger Andrus, Stephanie Balin, Michael Cohen, Joey Music Daniel, Dennis Eisenberg, Dina Fine, Jerry Finkelstein, Bobby Goodman, Hal Jason, Marilyn Paylette, Pamela Pigeon, who her mama is going in her place today. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jamie Pink, Myra Prescott, Faith Retsky, Daniel Rugoff, who just had a baby. I, we got the thing, so mazel tov to her. Um, Susan Shackman, Susie Schwartz, Jan Schwartz, David Siegel, Hillary Stern, Bonnie Whitman, and Dorothy Wolchansky. So by the power vested in me in the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, here's our slate of board for this coming year. Thank you so much. And I want to say it's just been wonderful to work with everyone here. It's a great group of people. Okay, now finally, Mitch Myers, our member at large. Here you go. Everyone came for. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Everybody's just tearing it up. All right. Whew. Like the way all right, my first guest, our first guest. Thank you all for being here, by the way. And, uh, I really appreciate this. Our first guest is Mark Elfenbein. Elf uh, was born in Houston. He moved to Dallas in 1969. He went to Hillcrest, graduated with a lot of us. Went to the University of Texas. He's been on sports radio talk show for 32 consecutive years. That's right. He started at KERA 90.1 FM. And if you noticed, Norm Hitchkiss said he was retiring. This man took his spot. There you go. Maybe that's why he's retiring. <laughs> he's been at the ticket from day one. He went to 105.3 Sports Radio. He had the Josh and Elf show. He worked with Jane Slater with the Elf and Slater show. He went to 103.3 Dallas. He went back to the ticket. If you want to hear him, he's on Sundays. He's got a bagel and a schmear every Sunday, I promise you. That's right. He is also a ring announcer. The man has jumped into boxing. Can you believe that? He's got the hair for it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. He's a dad. He's a dad. He's a son. He's a brother. He's a Zeta. And about to be another one, right? There you go. He's got a granddaughter, Sydney, and he's about to have another granddaughter. So Mark Elfenbein, everybody. There you go. Our next, our next guest is Robert Steinfeld. Everybody lovingly calls him Bobby. So come on out here, Bobby. Uh, imagine what it's like to make hundreds of decisions in just two hours on live network television and work seen by millions of people. That's what this gentleman does. He sits in that big chair, and he's been doing it for 40 years. He's crossed paths with Cal Ripken, Alex Rodriguez, Nolan Ryan, Nancy Lieberman, Tim Duncan, uh, Popovich also. Hey, let's give Pop a shout out. David Robinson, Bob Costas, Robin Robinson, Robin Roberts, and more. He's covered the Dream Team. He was in Barcelona. He was at the 96 Olympics. Uh, he's worked with Nolan Ryan and Randy Johnson on some documentaries or videos, instructional videos. He's done uh, production for the Mavericks, the Spurs, the Pelicans, and presently he's the executive director, uh, producer, excuse me, of the WNBA Dallas Wings. Yeah, Wings, all right. He's done uh, local, national, and uh, regional sports. He's worked in baseball, basketball, uh, college basketball, college football, NCAA championships. The man has won 14 sports Emmy Awards. He brought one with him. <laughs> he didn't want to bring any of them, but I was like, you got to bring an Emmy you Award. Made me bring My that. wife would love that Emmy Award. She's going to take it home with her. Anyway, he also won a five Telly Awards. Was that named after Telly Savalas? No. No, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out what that's got. 
He's got a book called Three, Two, One. We're on the air. That's great. There you go. He's five decades in sports. So Bobby Steinfeld, thank you for being here. Thank you. Number three, my man Chuck Cooperstein, right? The voice. There you go. Give it up. Give it up for Chuck. Yeah. He's in his 18th season as a radio play-by-play -play voice of the Dallas Mavericks on 97.1. The Freak, they call it the Freak right now. Okay, fits in real. He's been doing this since 1984. He's, prior to covering the Mavericks, he's covered TCU and the University of Texas football, as well as TCU, A&M, and SMU basketball. He's done college basketball, college football, NFL games nationally on Westwood One, he got the 2022 Texas Sportscaster of the Year Award by the National Sports Media. He's also received a KD Award for his play-by-play -play expertise from the Dallas Press Club. He's a Long, Long Island native. <laughs> he's, he's got his bachelor's degree in broadcasting from the University of Florida. That's right, there you go. And they, in 2024, they go to Austin and play Texas for, for the, the first, first time, time ever. For first the first time, time ever. ever, since 1920s. He's uh, married, his wife Karen. They have a P, P, hello, PR marketing and philanthropy consultant. Uh, they give, they're very giving. They have the Mavs Foundation, Texas Scottish Rights Hospital, among others. And they founded their own nonprofit, Coop's Kids Foundation. So welcome, Chuck Cooperstein. <laughs> And last but not least, my man Brad Sham. Come on out here, Brad. Yes. Yeah. Here you go. Brad Sham, known as the voice of the Dallas Cowboys. 45 years calling Emmett Smith left, Emmett Smith right, Zeke, Zeke. Touchdown. Yes. He's been in the broadcasting business for 53 years. I can't believe that. 28 Cotton Bowl Classics. He's done Big 12 basketball. NCAA basketball and football, as well as, of course, uh, NFL. He was in the Winter Olympics in Japan uh, uh, for Radio 1, uh, CBS Radio 1 Network. He's covered FC Dallas, Major League Soccer, NFL, uh, and also on CBS and Fox. He's done the Final Four, NASCAR. I didn't know they called NASCAR races it. Left turn, he's coming around. The <laughs> okay. <laughs> He Clearly, you didn't know they did it. <laughs> Clearly, <they> did. <laughs> Arena League, NFL Europe. He's uh, he's in a movie for crying out loud. He's been Oliver Stone's man in the feature W. Did you play W? I did not, but I actually did play the guy who I didn't realize at the time was John Dickerson. There you go. Okay, and he's also written a book, Stadium Stories, about the Dallas Cowboys. Love to read that. Graduated from the University of Missouri with a Bachelor of Journalism. D.O.U. Journalism, there you go. He's won eight Katy Awards from the Press Club in Dallas. He was named Texas Sportscaster of the Year 12 freaking times, man. Come on, 12 times. He also uh, was elected the media section of the Texas Sports Hall of Fame in 2020, Texas Radio Hall of Fame. He's a life member and board of director of the Cotton Bowl. He's a trustee of the Texas Sports Hall of Fame as well as a trustee of Temple Emanuel. He's a proud dad. He's a dog lover. And if you can guess what kind of dog he has, you get a pizza tonight. <laughs> Jazz fan and a TV junkie, Brad Sham. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. I'm going to turn it over to you. Hold up your hand if you're 30 minutes away from your bedtime. <laughs> You missed the show in the back. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> if we had microphones and TV cameras back there, that would have been. But we're going to have some fun tonight. Thank everybody for coming. And uh, we hope to have a good time. Now, I want to get this out of the way first, if that's okay. To each one of you guys, name me your favorite bagel and what do you want on it? Let's go. I want a garlic bagel with Nova, capers, and tomato. Sclafani's, that's for you, Coop. <laughs> does it, does it, I mean, isn't the locks like extra that doesn't, is that part of what you want on it? Does yes. that count? Yes, okay. absolutely. But Bradley, what about you? Now, I can, I can eat it without, 
I can definitely do without. Thank but, you. But it's, but it's always better. I know. I understand. I'm, I, you know, <laughs> my favorite bagels, whatever's in this bag. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. I figured we would get that one out of the way. And uh, I've known these guys for many, many years. So when I was asked to come here, I was like, well, this should be fun. This is old school week. Very, very good. So no particular order. Um, just give a quick where you originally are from and how did you get to Dallas? Uh, I grew up on Long Island. Uh, went to a Friends Academy uh, where my uh, basketball coach in high school was a guy named Albie Swartz, who was Luke Karnaseka's first great point guard at St. John's. And I played uh, on a team with Steve Mills, who went to Princeton and was later the president and general manager of the New York Knicks. He played and I watched. Um, I, uh, like most Jewish players. Exactly, exactly. Uh, as as uh, was mentioned, I, w I went to Florida, uh, came back and worked at an outfit called Sports Phone. And uh, I was there two and a half years and did a lot of freelance work. Uh, among them, uh, the, the people I worked for was Camel X in St. Louis. And I did some work for them, and uh, KMOX connected, uh, or I shouldn't say connected, they told Brad Sham about me. And basically got to a point where we were, uh, Carol, he was getting ready to do night sports. Um, and we were you know, all news at that time. There was no talk at that time. And uh, the, apparently, as this is how I have heard the story, Brad, I, don't, I, I think this is correct, uh, that Rob Silverstein, who was the executive producer at KMOX, uh, was with Brad. Brad asked about this other guy, and Rob said, no, you don't want to hire that guy. You want to hire this guy, Cooperstein, in New York. He knows what he's doing. Well, so Brad calls me and uh, says, hey, how'd you like to work in Dallas? And I said, sure, I love it. So, well, send me your tape and resume. Uh, I did, like I did about 800 other times, and, you know, never, never got the, the response I was looking for. And literally five weeks later, with no interview, no nothing, I got hired. And the first time Brad and I ever met was the day on, I'll never, the first day of the Republican National Convention in Dallas. It was August 20th, 1984. Most of those stick in my memory, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 walked in, I walked into the, to the uh, front entrance at KRLD, and Brad was there, and here I am. You, you did leave out the part about the fact that you worked as a stringer for KMOX doing golf tournaments like play-by-play out on the course and long form reports. Right. So that was a big, I didn't hear just sports phone. What I'm wondering is if I gave you $20 right now, <laughs> could you give us 90 seconds of what you sounded like on sports phone? Well, well, it was only a 60 second message. So All right. But <laughs> I'll up it to $40. Let's go. 10, how about $10? For thirty seconds. Well, I, I I need a I need a scoreboard in front of me. Make and, it up. All right, but all right. Chuck Cooperstein for Sports Phone, brought to you by the New York Daily News. Rangers won, Angels nothing. Top of the fifth. It's Ibaldi against Otani. U.S. Open at Los Angeles Golf Club. Xander Shoffley and Ricky Fowler eight under par. Record tying sixty twos. Record setting sixty twos. Uh, what else can – there is no basketball, there is no hockey. We are not here until the playoffs, until the draft next week. So we, we but, basically – we basically we did 20 – I could do 26 scores in 58 seconds. It was twice as fast as yes. that, yeah. And didn't you always end it with it's over and I'm out? No, it did not, no we did not do that. We, did, we always said – on sports phone, we said stay with us. Oh, I like that. Stay with us. All right, Brad, where would um, you I, come from? I'm, I'm I, from I, Chicago, and I'm pretty sure I got here by car. <laughs> pretty sure. How'd you get started here? Um, I got a job. I was in the army out of school. Um, was couldn't find a job for a little while. My folks had moved here, and I wound up getting a news job with what was then WRRAM, which is on the frequency that the ticket has been on. And I was a news reporter for a few months till I wormed my way into sports. Everything else sprung from that. Um, if my dad's job when I got out of the Army had been in Des Moines or Portland or Bangor, Maine, I wouldn't be here right now. So that's either uh, luck or divine intervention Whatever you wanted to, whatever you want to consider it. Everything else came from that. Robert Steinfeld, yourself? 
Yeah, um, I was born in New Jersey, and we moved to uh, <clears throat> Dallas in, uh, when I was nine years old. And we lived right by the JCC, like right across the street on Valleydale Drive, and went to Arthur Kramer Elementary School, went to Franklin Middle School, uh, played baseball on the Franklin and Hillcrest High School team. Um, one of my teammates uh, and classmates, along with Jeff, was uh, David Mantle, uh, Mickey Mantle's son. So that was like really cool. And you know, we're still friends, and you know, we're having our 50th uh, reunion uh, in April. And I'm sure he'll be there. Last time in the, we had the 40th, we took our picture. He looks just like his dad did. But, so that was cool. But in, uh, in high school, I met the best teacher I've ever had. And that was uh, someone that influenced my career was uh, my high school ju journalism teacher, Julia Jeffress. And she taught me how to, uh, and us, how to write, how to edit. Um, taught us how if you write a lead for a paragraph, if you go back and read it and say, so what, then you need to write it again. <laughs> you know, so um, she taught us about the inverted pyramid, the three W's and the H's. So by the time I got to the University of Texas, uh, I was already writing on the Daily Texan staff before I even started at school because I brought, what she taught me how to do is take a string book with every story that I've written and I take it down to uh, the Daily Texan, and they hired me right away. And my first assignment in 1974, when I was a freshman, was covering the University of Texas uh, football scrimmage. And I still have that string book from every Daily Texan. And the headline says, freshman Earl Campbell rushes for three touchdowns. Wow. And, and that was, so he was a freshman the same year I was. but. And Daryl Royal never played freshman, but he did because Roosevelt Leakes got injured, so he, he put him in. So um, played him at fullback. Played him at fullback. Yeah, played him in the wishbone. Right, he did in the wishbone, and that was great going to all those games. But just back uh, back to something that kind of ties in with a friend of Brad's uh, is that when I was going to school uh, at at uh, Arthur Kramer Elementary School. I was inviting like reporters from Channel 8 to come to our class. And I would like have like Jerry Park and Cecile Berant and, <laughs> and all those people. And then uh, uh, I, the principal allowed me to take a uh, bus down to Channel 8. And I sat in the studio and watched with Vern Lundquist when he was at Channel 8. And I would go there all the time. And I would like go into his office. And I think Mark Oristano was also there at that point. And I would see like the script from the newscast and stuff in the trash. And I would pull it out. And this was like treasure. <laughs> I'm like looking at it. I go, I got to save this. This is really cool. And it's so different when you write for broadcast than you do for regular journalism. So, you know, that, that to me was a really good start. And then when I was at the University of Texas, I kind of blazed my own way to get an internship with ABC Sports. And they would call our AE Pi, uh, Kurt Gowdy Jr., Kurt, uh, you know, his son, he was working as a BA for ABC. And he would call our fraternity house phone and ask if I was there, you know, because they would fly me around the country while I was in, in, uh, in college to work on the AABC game, because they didn't have all these other cable and everything. And to make a long story short, then I was able to convince the University of Texas to give me a three hours credit and an internship for working for ABC. <laughs> and, and you know, and that was great. And so um, in three years, I was at the University of Texas and I was working with ABC on their national game at right at college. So Brad and Coop, obviously play by play. And I think we all, I'll speak for everybody, whether you like it or not, uh, both are the best at what they do. Absolutely, we are gifted <laughs> and lucky. And I'm one of those guys that I like to turn down the sound of the TV and listen to what's on the radio. And because they paint the picture as better than anybody can do it. But the question is, uh, why play by play and who was your guy? Because we all had a guy growing up, your favorite play by play guy. Who was your guy? Well, why play by play? I had a Jewish mother. I didn't play anything. <laughs> so what am I going to do? Color? <laughs> Um, Jack Brickhouse was oh. Jack Brickhouse was the uh, voice of everything in Chicago sports. He did uh, both the Cubs and the White Sox on television, a little bit of the Bulls, and he did the Bears on the radio. 
And uh, the other kind of role model that I had was Jack Buck, because growing up, we lived a lot of places, including many in the Midwest, and you could hear KMOX from St. Louis all over the country. Yes. And Jack always struck me as being so versatile. He could do anything and sound the same greatness. And he was the voice of St. Louis sports. When Harry Carey was there, Jack Buck was still, he did talk shows, he did game shows, he did all kinds of stuff. I got to be friends with him before he died, and that was really uh, incredibly rewarding. And by the way, although he wasn't my guy in that way, but uh, Frank Gleber, God rest his soul, uh, to me, I still think the most naturally gifted sportscaster I ever met, and he was a lot like Jack. He could do anything, and he brought the same approach to doing the 14th hole at the Masters. I'm not exaggerating. And to doing uh, an NCAA tournament game and to doing uh, log rolling from Canada. And putt -putt. I mean, he did all of that. And putt-putt. Putt-putt with Billy Packer. Yeah, he did all. Of Frank was the king of the deal. For his kid, this is not a joke. His kids wanted a trampoline. And so Frank made a deal with a local sporting goods store to do commercials that ran at midnight, and he got a trampoline for his kids. <laughs> and he did the putt-putt stuff, made a lot of money with mm -hmm. working with Billy Packer for years. He, Frank could do anything, and he and Jack Buck had that in common in my mind. And Frank, you know, for many, for many years, when I, and when I first moved to Dallas, you know, Frank did morning sports on KRLD. And he was the first person that I knew who did not come into the studio, who did his, did his uh, sportscast remotely. They, had, they put a hard line in his house, and he would do a live sportscast at 6.45 in the morning, and then he would tape out the rest of his sportscast, uh, basically, I think, through 8, 8, 8.45 or 9.15. Yeah, he, he eventually uh, took to taping them out when uh, they, they had that rig right next to his bed. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Frank would doze back off in between <laughs> sports guests. And there was a Frank, time. Frank, you're up. You're up. There, well, there was a time or two when the news anchor would say, and here it's, it's 7.15 with sports. Here's Frank Gleber. And you would hear. I don't know if you remember the, the Ray Malavese uh, at the Super Bowl uh, yeah. when the sleep and the whole bit. But Frank, but. So Frank would he do that, and then literally he would rip out four other two and a half minute sportscasts, no stumbles, no nothing. He may not have watched anything that had happened the night before, and it didn't matter. It was it was it was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. It was ever it, it was absolutely brilliant. We shared doing play by play of SMU basketball on the radio at KRLD. He would do whatever games he wanted. I would do the other ones. And uh, this was uh, whatever year it was, the last year before the shot clock. You'll help me. Uh, John Conkac with SMU. Well, and that, yeah, it was, it was 80, well, 84. It was okay, 84. 84. Yeah. So, so now the regular season ends, and Frank gets his assignment. Now, I'm going with SMU because Frank's going to be on television. <clears throat> and Frank gets the assignment of SMU and Georgetown in uh, – in uh, Washington. Where, uh, in uh, Pullman. Pullman, Washington. Pullman, Washington. Now, let me say this again. Frank's done at least, you know, 15 or 18 SMU games through the year. <laughs> so now he's getting ready. So he comes to me. He gets his assignment, and he comes to me. He I can see him le leaning over this counter and saying to me, All right, who plays for SMU? <laughs> He needed to know what he needed to know when he needed to know it. And what would happen is if you turned on his broadcast, you would think that he recruited every kid personally, that he invented the game and made the rules. He was an absolute genius. That was just a gift. Bobby, I know there wasn't play-by-play -play guys in terms of what you did, even though you produced and directed and do all the things you did. But for yourself, who inspired you to do what you, I mean, what did you see that made you go, that's what I want to do? I just love sports. And like, I go, what the heck? I might as well get paid for it. 
So I did. And, you know, I'd still be watching sports. I watch sports at home, you know, when I, you know, when, when I'm home not working, which is a lot. But, and I don't know, it's just, I just, you know, we used to go to the Dallas Chaparral games at Moody Coliseum growing up. And we'd watch, uh, we'd go down there and we'd see Terry Stembridge doing the play-by-play. -play and then we'd go backstage and uh, back to the locker rooms and they would let us go back there and we'd see Connie Hawkins and, you know, all kinds of great players, you know, and, and the Dallas Maverick players. And it, it, I don't know, I just, I just loved it in sports and in television. I was intrigued with it in journalism. And that's how it pretty much started. And, and uh, you know, Marv was my guy. Yeah. Um, and, but I, you know, I was lucky in New York. I mean, I had Lindsey Nelson and Bob Murphy doing the Mets. And I had Marty Clickman doing the Giants. And I had Merle Harmon doing the Jets, wow. who later came down here and was and the And we worked the on our Ranger for, games for, for many years. years. The nicest guy. The, the nicest world. human being that's mm -hmm. ever walked the planet. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, it's funny you mentioned Terry. I still use Terry's page yeah. as my as my base when I start doing my notes for the game and, and so and I've never met Terry but yeah, uh, I but I, you know I know uh, I'll have you know I did the only Dallas Chaparral games on the radio that Terry Stembridge didn't do really yes <laughs> wow. because we had him on WRR Terry was tapped to do television for the ABA all-star game and so he had to miss a game or two there were maybe two or three of them um, and yeah that was a big that was a big kick for me. Does anybody here know who the play-by-play -play guy for the Spirits of St. Louis was? Bob Costas. Yes. Bob Not Costas. You guys? I, I, I have, know you guys know that. I have a letter. <laughs> yeah. I have a letter. I from, was on City Slickers for a second. <laughs> I have a letter from Bernie Fox, who was the yeah. sports director of KMOX. I applied for that job. Did you? And I have a letter from Bernie Fox telling me that I did not get the job. And I was like, I finished third, and they had a young kid out of Syracuse that they hired, and they thought had a good future, and, you know, right. and good luck to you. You guys have been with teams for a long time, Cowboys, Mavericks, and you've been with the Spurs and everybody else. You've been a part of losing seasons, which, as we know, sucks. But what's it like to be with a team when it wins it all? Tell me what that's like. The championship, the parade, the whole nine yards. Well, well, let Brad talk about the Cowboys. That's what people want to hear, probably. You know, but for me, it was a first spur because I want to address okay. the question the way Elf asked it. With the I mean, <laughs> the uh, look, th there is nothing like winning, and and certainly in that moment, uh, you, you know that, especially on radio, and especially with the fact that we, uh, you know, we're the local voice at that time. There's no local television, so there's a certain sense of responsibility that you have in that moment that you hope you get it you know you get that moment right when the horn sounds game is over series is over Mavericks have won and you know and, and what are you going to say and you know I've never scripted anything in my life but I certainly had an idea in that moment of what I wanted to say and the, the image that I wanted to convey and so that's how the whole planting the flag thing happened but you know from that moment Going back to the, going back to the hotel, um, and my, my wife Karen was with me at that time, and uh, you know the, the party at the Fontainebleau, and just the the magnums of champagne that are just all over the place. I mean, even after I got done working, I saw Rick Carlisle was still out on the floor, and he just runs to me, and we hug each other, and all that. Uh, you know, the parade was amazing, and it, you know it's interesting watching some of the the video from the parade today in Denver. And the craziness that went on there, and, I, and I, it made me think about how, uh, just how orderly and how happy everybody was that day in the parade, and then leading to the arena for the rally. And there were 20,000 people in the arena, and they're going nuts the moment you know they see all these people. Um, and then you know that night, that following the parade, Rick um, Rick invited Mark Followell uh, and uh, and his wife and Karen and me. Uh, to the operations group party at uh, Nick and Sam's, he bought out the he bought out the back room in Nick and Sam's, and basically said, "Hey, you know, he had won uh, a championship with Boston in 1986, and this is 2011." And he said, "Hey, look, I do this only once every 25 years, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so enjoy this." But just being a part of of all of that, it's it's still the headiest 
thing that I've really ever been through. And obviously, we just had the anniversary, uh, the what, the 12th anniversary. It's getting longer and longer, um, you know, since, it was, it was since the Mavericks won that night in Miami. And um, there's, there's nothing like it. Uh, it's, you know, the, the games are always great. I mean, and the prep is always great for me. I mean, I love doing the work, but there's something nice about there being a payoff there at the end. Bradley? You want me to go? No, you go. Oh, okay. hey, Bobby, it's your turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was really privileged to be able to be with the San Antonio Spurs for 23 years. And uh, I did the Mavericks for eight, and then I was asked to go to San Antonio to consult for a year. And I did, and then they asked me, can you just come down here and do our games? I still lived here. I commute to San Antonio uh, and everything. And fortunately, when I came down there, my first year was 1989, and that was the year that this, the Spurs had a rookie named David Robinson. So they, I was there for the David Robinson era. I was there for the Tim Duncan era. I was there for four of their five championships. You've had it rough. Yeah, and but what was so good about it is they, they really treat us as part of a family. You know, if you do the Spurs, you have to kind of be, drink the Kool-Aid, you know, do the way that they like to. And, you know, they, uh, they were nice enough to us. They gave us championship rings. Uh, my ring ceremony, whereas normally, you know, when you watch a, a ring ceremony, they have it the next year and they have it on national TV, they raise the banner, they get presented their rings. My ring ceremony was uh, next to the Dipsy dumpster by the production truck and the loading dock. <laughs> they go, here, here's your ring in a nice box and everything, but that, that was that. But I was there, I was there, you know, for one of the, you know, for the championship game, I was sitting right there, I was up with the team, you know, when they were taking the pictures, I wasn't in the, I was just off to the side. It would crop me out, but I was there. And then they invited you know, me, of course. I went back down to San Antonio, and I was able to, uh, to ride on, uh, with, the, with some of the, the team members on the float you know, in the San Antonio River for the parade. So the parade was on the river. That was cool. We were throwing out beads and, and all that. But this is the one story about you know, being with the Spurs, I think, would really apply here, was the uh, Tim Duncan story. And... Uh, you know, as a television producer, you know, I get to the venue at about, you know, seven hours before the game, and I'm going to, uh, the game was in uh, Toronto. And so, you know, one of the rules when you're with the team and the players is you're really not supposed to talk to the players. You know, you're on the bus with them and you fly with them. If they want to say something to you and you, whatever, you know, you can mingle with them a little bit. But I happened to arrive at Air Canada Center then, it was called, at about 1230. And the team was still out there at the shoot around. Well, my production truck wasn't open for another hour and I'd just flown in. So I went out and sat on the court and watched the end of the practice. Well, the practice was ending and then there were some clothes on, a, on the chair next to me. I didn't know who it was, but then all of a sudden the team is dispersing off the floor and it's Tim Duncan and he's walking right towards me. And I remembered, like, from the previous game, he was not feeling really well and everything. And I go, well, should I say something or not? I go, yeah. So he comes up, and I said, um, I go, Tim, how are you feeling? And he goes, oh, I'm feeling really, actually, uh, pretty good today. I'm going to play tonight. And then he looks at me and goes, well, how are you? And I'm going, what's he asking? I go, well, I feel great. Uh, yesterday, I scored 21 points in the JBA, the Jewish Basketball Association. <laughs> 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 and, he, and he looks at me and goes, got to dominate where you can. <laughs> That's true. That's a true story. That's some of the best advice I ever heard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Bradley. Well, um, I have a couple of uh, pretty close friends in this room who have heard some of this from me. Um, so, so I'm going to start with the... I think it's more than a supposition. We began as fans. It's pretty clear we're all still fans. So we know how fans think. We have been fans and we remain fans. I grew up, my mother raised me to be a Chicago Cubs fan, bless my heart. And, uh, and I literally tell people this all the time and they think I'm kidding, but I mean it. Um, because they were so bad for so much of my life that I came to understand examining the way I enjoy it in spite of what they were putting on the field that I've never been in it for the winning. 
I'm in it for the journey. I enjoy the games. I'm not happy when they lose. I've been known to curse out loud. Um, but that's the, that's the baseline. So your question was, everyone knows losing sucks. What's it like to be around them when they win? I have never blocked or tackled anyone in my life. I can only answer the question from a perspective that Chuck touched on. That is from what we do. I think I could say, if, you ever, if you've ever heard me, I know I could say, if you've ever heard him, you understand that we were hardwired with a passion for what we do. That fuels us. I also learned fairly early, and Vern was one of the ones who helped teach me, that it uh, didn't matter what the event was I was doing, and it didn't matter how many people were watching or listening. What mattered was that you treat the audience with respect. So I've had the great good fortune to broadcast four Super Bowls. I've run the gamut of being the same age as the players to being as old of, as some of their grandfathers. So I've been close to them and not close to them. Three years in a row, in the uh, right around 2000, there were five and 11. Dave Campo's years, they were hamstrung by uh, the salary cap. And uh, at Texas Stadium, I used to park in the lot, and I would usually I would walk down to the field before I did anything else. And I remember walking down one day in the middle of the three, five, and eleven seasons, and I thought to myself, "God, I love this. I just love this. I get to do this. It's the reason I chose the profession. I was I had a, a, a literal epiphany watching." baseball games in Chicago that the, the announcers were the same guys every day. That meant they were at the ball game every day. I want to go to the ball game every day. That's why I got into the business, and it's why I do what I do. I had no concept of money, and if you could see my paycheck, you would understand I clearly don't to this day. <laughs> and I remember walking down to the field in the middle, of, and they were terrible. And, and finding Campo and telling him that I just had that experience, he said, me too. I mean, you know, look, Campo knew who he was and where he was. Um, we just love it. So when you say losing sucks, you know, um, if two teams play, unless there's a tie, one of them is going to lose. But there's going to be another game. And, and if it's the last game of the year, then it'll, there'll be another game next year. Our job, as I see it, is to bring the enthusiasm and the love of the game and the knowledge of the team to the people listening. I can't control if they win or lose. Am I happier when they win? Of course. You know why? Because when I'm handing out prayer books at Temple Emmanuel, I don't, I'm not kidding about this. I don't get asked, what's wrong with the Cowboys? <laughs> I walked into a board meeting at Temple Emmanuel last year. A woman that I'd known for years, they'd lost the first game. I walked in, I swear to God. The woman looked right, I said, hi, I won't tell your name. I said, hi, she said, well, you did a terrible job Sunday. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon? I said, actually, I did a hell of a job Sunday. And we understand that fans feel that way because we are fans. We get it. My job is to reflect um, disappointment professionally when they lose. He's great at this. Eric Nadell is fantastic at it. Re 
react professionally with disappointment when they lose, exult when they win, but when they win, when they win a game, when they make the playoffs, when they've won a Super Bowl, I promise you, I'm not happy for me. I didn't do anything. But the players who we're around and we see the physical price they pay to play the game. You can say, oh, look at all the money they're making. Absolutely right. Now you go out there for a 20th of that and do what they're doing for a week. They are literally giving up their bodies, almost every professional sport. When you see them pay that price and you get to know them personally and you get to see them exult in what, in what they've done, that's the joy. Can you imagine what Dirk Nowitzki must have felt like? I mean, we all could see how happy he was. Can you imagine, after everything he put into getting to that point, what it felt like for him? That's who we're happy for. If they win a Super Bowl this year, it'll be fun to be around them. I'll love it. I get paid by the game in the playoffs. The more, the merrier. Come on. <laughs> but I won't be happy for me because I haven't blocked or tackled anyone. But if they win a Super Bowl this year, I'll be over the moon for Dak Prescott and Zach Martin and Tyron Smith and guys I've known for a long time, and I know what they put of themselves into it. So when you say losing sucks, that's your problem. <laughs> Adjust your attitude. There's going to be losing. If you're a baseball fan, the best hitter in the league fails 70% of the time. Keep it in perspective. Remember what price the players, managers, and coaches are paying to entertain us. And... Um, because of that, I just don't see losing as sucking. Okay, I, that was beautiful. Very well said. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that we've all grown up with sports. We love sports. But we all have a story to share. Yom Kippur falls on game day. Talk to me. Don't do it. Don't do it. Never have. Easy. It's the easiest. And I, I, I am not, I would not consider myself terribly religious. Uh, I don't go to temple, uh, save for the high holidays, but I do respect the custom. It's really important to me. And, uh, and, I, and I have missed games uh, because of it. I, fortunately, um, most of that is in the preseason, and that's, and that's all well and good, but that's a no-brainer, easy call. I've, I've never worked on the high holidays in my entire life. We were lucky I was lucky that um, before the NFL moved good games to Sunday night, Sunday night was what Monday night is now. It was just somebody had to be on national television. So there weren't going to be good teams on Sunday night. So it was dumb luck that there was never a game. In 2015 was the first time it happened to me. It was with Arab Rosh Hashanah. Was that right? Was it? No, it was. It was. It was Yom Kippur. It was. It was the day of Yom Kippur. Didn't Vern? Well, yeah, Vern came in, and, and I got Vern to come in and do the game. But when there, when I saw that for the first, okay, there's a, they're playing Sunday night. By the way, they're playing the New York Giants on Erev Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> How many Jews are in New York? <laughs> what are you doing? Gotta what are you doing? <laughs> How many season ticket holders? I mean, exactly. And the, no, Most of the guys who made the schedule. I don't care. You, you don't have to go to yeshiva. What are you doing? <laughs> but okay, fine. When I saw that, there wasn't, there wasn't a decision. There's no decision. You just there was, and and I'm I consider myself fairly observant, but I haven't always been. But I've never, whatever job I was doing, I've never worked on the high holidays, and I never would, and I never will, and. Um, your employer is just going to have to understand that. Sometimes it costs you money, but that's not the most important thing. Bob, same thing? I've, I've been on the road, like uh, doing a football game or wherever I've been, 
uh, around that time, I've always found a synagogue or a Hillel or something. And you would not necessarily think, you know, in Stillwater, Oklahoma, I found one. Uh, I was at College Station. I was there. Uh, I once drove like 30 minutes to a small synagogue outside, like in Iowa somewhere. And uh, they welcomed me into their synagogue. And, you know, that was, you know, it was a small synagogue. And they welcomed me as a bar. So, so, yeah, it's kind of cool, you know, to see that, you know, the different synagogues and the Hillels I've participated in. You've been all over the world. You guys have traveled like crazy. Everybody's got a favorite town that they get to go to to call a game. What's your town, and where's the place you have to go eat at? <laughs> My, have to go eat have at. Have to go eat at. Because you're going to go eat at. My favorite town is Dallas, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, partly because I'm on, I was on the road for so much. When I'm coming home, it's nice to be home. But really, we were really disappointed when the uh, when uh, Seattle uh, lost the team because uh, the N in the NBA because we love going to Seattle you know eating the fresh salmon I never knew there were so many types of salmon until you go in a restaurant <laughs> and there's like a list of like 30 or 40 different kinds there's something uh, other than lox <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's a great that was a great place to go and we also loved uh, going to Vancouver when the Grizzlies were there. And to this day, well, just think they, about, they just moved think to about this. They what did you just hit a nerve? <laughs> uh, this, this definitely, we traded in the NBA. David Stern somehow managed to trade Vancouver and Seattle for Memphis and Oklahoma City. Right, and, and something. Good, bar, I, good barbecue now, now, in Memphis. There's, there's good, yeah, I mean, you can go to Rendezvous, and that's, that's well, all well. When, when we're in Memphis, we're still trying to figure out where the grizzly bears are running along the Mississippi <laughs> River? I don't think so. Yeah, so we, 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 we messed that up. We yeah. messed that up really bad. Really bad. Um, doing football, for me, the criteria are a little different. When you ask me what's my favorite town to work in, my answer is always colored by the working conditions. <laughs> they, they vary. For many, many years, when Chuck started doing the Mavericks, he knew where his seat was going to be in every arena. Now they're getting treated like we have been forever and ever. And he's done a lot of college football. And, and he gets treated worse there. And you get treated worse there. <laughs> so, um, so my answer is always colored by the working conditions. Can I see the game? How big's my desk? Is there ample light? How far do I have to go to get to the bathroom? I'm not kidding. And the older I get, the less I'm kidding. Uh, those things, if, if you can have a great town, and if you've got crap working conditions, then you don't look forward to going to that town. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. SoFi Stadium. Some of you have been have been in SoFi Stadium as fans. One or two of you have been in SoFi Stadium's visiting broadcast booth. Crap. Amateurish. Two-bit. I don't want to go. I'm go they're going to go every year. But we, we're, in a, we're in a poor vantage point. There's, there's so many things wrong with the location, it's ridiculous. No, I said SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, the big brand new stadium in Los Angeles. Okay, so don't tell me you want to go to L.A. There's great places to eat in L.A. I don't want to go there. I want to go to New England because in New England, when they built Gillette Stadium, they built a long suite of sizable booths below suite level. I don't know, 25 rows, 30 rows up. I'll tell you a little funny story. Oh, yes. The first time the Cowboys played in Gillette Stadium, AT&T Stadium wasn't even on the drawing board yet. But so every broadcaster from network television to visiting Spanish radio is in one of these booths at the at the between the 35 yard lines and low so we're standing on the field and i'm standing up there looking at this suite of booths and jerry jones is not often on the field early but he came out there that day and there was talk he was going to build a stadium and i walked up to him and i said see all that right there 
you know, you can build a stadium and put all the broadcasters where they can see the game. <laughs> and he looked at it for a minute, and he said, do you have any idea how many millions of dollars of foot space that is? <laughs> said, I, I, I like you, but I don't like you that much. I said, I, I appreciate the candor. The working conditions are in New England are, for me, the very best. Um, Baltimore is really good. And have crab cakes at halftime. Sorry? I, that, I don't care about that. I, I, I really don't care that they have a Jewish owner. It doesn't make any difference. Um, and they have crab cakes at halftime. And they have crab cakes at halftime. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, you know, I, really I, I love going stuff. to Chicago, even though the working conditions are just average. Um, but I'm a Chicagoan. I love being in Chicago. So then the other part of it is where do you have to eat? Yeah. So that depends. For instance, if I say we're going to San Francisco, I mean, you could probably name a half dozen places in San Francisco that you have to eat, right? Absolutely. But we don't get anywhere near San Francisco. The 49ers play in Santa Clara. We're 45 minutes away. I'm not staying up till 2 in the morning to have dinner, okay? I'll eat room service. That's, I, I didn't go there for that. So I don't necessarily get to go. Now, when I did baseball, now then if you're on the road and you know, you've got like three days in a city, and then lunch becomes the key meal, and you can go anywhere you want for lunch, and then you open up a whole new vista of, of travel things. But, so I, I mean, it, to me it's all about the working conditions. And I'm right there with them. Um, there are places, again, back in the day when I first started in the NBA, we were always on the floor. Now there's only one place in the league where we are actually on the front row, and that's in Chicago. Uh, and I think if Jerry Reinsdorf could put us at the top of the United Center, he would put us at the top of the United Center. Um, uh, working conditions are really important. Uh, San Francisco, in their, in their new building, they, they literally built booths. They built booths for all of us. So there's, you're, you're at mid-level, you've you got plenty of space at the table, uh, you know, you get the stats run to you when you need, when you need it, the, the monitor is in the correct place. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, Los Angeles uh, in the Staples Center or whatever they're calling it these days, it's still Staples Center to me, that's, that's always, that was a really good spot. Uh, and when they built it, Chick Hearn, who was the longtime voice of the Lakers and who was a vice president of the Lakers, he was consulted about, Chick, where do you want to do the game from? Because at the Forum, the old building, he was way upstairs and like in a corner and whatever. But they actually consulted him. Uh, they're, they're not consulting us about where we're, where we're doing the game. But uh, it's, it's a really good spot. You know, you're, you're low enough that you can get the, kind of get the feel of the game, which is what we miss the most, not being on the floor. But, uh, again, if, if the table is deep enough and my computer sits and my scorebook sits and all that, then, uh, then I'm good to go. Uh, the worst places are Boston, without question. Boston, they, if, this, if this is the court, the benches are here, we are here in the corner. And we are blocked out, we are blocked out by by one of the stanchions in the basket, which leads to a very funny story. So they, they had moved us from the, from the floor, the second row over there, and uh, Joe Tate, who was the longtime play-by-play -play voice of the Cavaliers and who was absolutely fantastic. Um, the first year he was there, there was a play, it was a fast break, and it's up the left side, and a pass into the corner for a shot by a player to be named later. <laughs> 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 and, and, and Joe, you know, Joe is, Joe is at the point in his career that he, he did not give a shit. He, did, he, did, he, he could say whatever he wanted, do it. They, they were, you know, nobody, nobody was taking him, taking him down. So uh, that's bad. And frankly, and this kills me, Madison Square Garden is awful. Awful, 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 awful. It is, it is still the greatest place, as far as I'm concerned, to watch a game because the atmosphere is just absolutely incredible. But for the working conditions and what the Knicks do, and frankly what the NBA allows, uh, with the NBA office being a mile from Madison Square Garden, and that they allow the Knicks to get away with it, it's just unconscionable. We, I mean, we're literally, we're kind of sitting about 
this tight. The table is about that big. Um, you know, normally we're supposed to have room for four. They don't give us room for four. They give us room for three. So I don't even use a stat guy in New York as much as I really want to. Um, we are, um, I don't know if, you, if, if you've been to the garden uh, before the redo, uh, what basically would be the second promenade where the green seats were back in the day. That's, that's kind of where we are. We're looking, we're looking literally through glass to do the, because of uh, OSHA, OSHA regulations. Uh, and, there's, and there's only one way out uh, to get behind it. It's, it and, and normally in the NBA, we get stats at every time out. Uh, and then I can, I can ask for some extra stuff generally if I want. In New York, you're lucky if you get it at the quarter and you never get it. It's, you know, in the three minutes or so between the time the horn sounds and at the end of the game, uh, and when I come back on to start the post game to get a get a final box, absolutely impossible. Cannot be done. Wor wor worst conditions of all. We all have been very lucky to do what we love, as Brad said it, you know, we, and Bobby said it. We love sports. We love what we love. We're blessed to be around it. It's fantastic. That being said, we all have sports bucket lists, and we have life bucket lists. I'm curious. What life bucket list are you waiting to do? I just went to Israel for the first time in my life, and it was the greatest thing I've ever done. It was unbelievable. For, for two weeks, I cannot wait to go back. So I'm curious, because we've done, you guys have all done so much in sports. Is there something that you haven't done to, not announcing, but just as a fan, and then life bucket list? Where have you not gone yet? I actually made myself about um, 13 years ago, I made a sports bucket list. And the only thing uh, – now, keep in mind, I've been just stupid lucky. I've covered the Masters. I've been to the Kentucky Derby. I've been to in the Indianapolis 500. I've done Super Bowls and World Series. Although the World Series and the College World Series were on my bucket list, but the Rangers helped with that in 2010 and 11. Uh, the one thing that's still on my sports bucket list is uh, Wimbledon during the tournament. Okay. During the tournament. doesn't have to be the championship. I've been to the town, but so I'm I'm working on that. Um, I got a guy. <laughs> I'll be calling you. Uh, you know, there's a I, I uh, uh, believe it or not, I've never been to Italy. I haven't either, and I That's really want to go. Okay, let's do this. Let's go to Wimbledon and then Italy in one trip. <laughs> well, I I was actually thinking I had some life events that got in the way this okay. year, but I was considering. Um, there's a great jazz festival in Montreux, Switzerland, and it's around the f same time as Wimbledon. And I was starting to look at how can I go to Wimbledon and Montreux? And I uh, wasn't able to do that this year, so we'll see. Sometime down the road, maybe. All right. Coop? Um, you know, it's amazing when you, as long as I've been in the business, I really haven't seen very much of the world. You know, I was lucky with the Mavericks uh, in 2012. We went to Berlin and Barcelona for a week, which was uh, pretty amazing. And certainly in the case of Barcelona, it's like we were there two and a half days and you need about 10 because there's just so, there's just so much going on there. But, um, you know, I, I, I would really like to go to Australia. Um, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't like cold weather. And, of course, when I would be able to go, that would be kind of the cold time of the year. But I just... Bitch, I, bitch, I, well, bitch. I just say, well, no, no if, if don't let me. I just I might just have to suck it up and go. All right? And just do... And do but, uh, All right, I'll go to Australia. <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I really... Because everything I hear about Australia is awesome. And I, the, the people are the best. And even just the Australians who come here... And especially the golfers that I've gotten to know, you know, through the years, that they're they're just the best people. They have the most fun. They're just, you know, I'd I'd like to see you know a whole bunch more of those. And you know what? I'd like to. I'm not an opera person, but I'd like to see the Sydney Opera House. You know, and I just just to see it in person, just to see like how, how does somebody build something like that? Um, you know, Barcelona is like the, the architecture in, in Barcelona is just incredible. Um, and then you know, for a sporting event, I mean. I've not been to Kentucky Derby or Indy. Indy, Indy does not move me. Uh, the Derby, I'm kind of curious about. Um, Two minutes, it's good. I, yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a, it's really unique. It's it's, it's a it's whole a unique days. event, and it's not just the two minutes. You, right. you got to do like two or three days. Yeah. It's really unique. Um, you know, 
I went, I went to the World Cup when it was here in 94, but I really can't wait for it to get here in 26. And I really, I, I really want to be more a part of that. I think just because I, 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 I think I, most of the time, I remember in 94, I was probably I was working during most of, the, most of the games and never really had a chance to get out and really experience it. Well, I don't have to worry about that now. So um, I, I really, you know, whether or not you know, we get the final here uh, or just wh wherever they're playing in the United States, I think there's, I think just to, I, I mean, it's, it's got to be like a Super Bowl every game. And so so I, th I think that's the thing I really want to see. Bob, you've been to a lot of places. Yeah, but growing up, we never traveled to go anywhere. And so, you know, our family really couldn't afford it. But so that's part of the reason why I think I accept all this travel now, because I'm able to go see places and do things that I never had an opportunity to go, you know, doing World Cup, doing three Olympics, you know, and going to Greece, Barcelona, you know, Atlanta. Granted, there was one, you know, and, and you know, being able to travel with my family to, you know, we've been to Italy and France and S Switzerland, you know, and that those are great places you need to go in Israel twice. I love that. Haven't been up in Scandinavia or even in Holland. And maybe I'd like to do that. My most people don't know my grandmother was actually from Sweden. So I have a little bit of that background, maybe, but I'd love to maybe go go there sometime um, and sporting event. You know, I haven't been to a Masters. That would be kind of cool to go to. I'm not really big with crowds and everything. I think part of that is because I've always had a, a pass and I've been back behind the scenes. And, you know, I, I'm kind of like don't need that, really. But the, as a fan now, things... The, the Masters is, is... Hard to walk. I, I was fortunate. My wife surprised me with a trip to the Masters four years ago, uh, the year the Tiger won. Is, and cool. and, I, and I, got, I got to go the last day. Uh, it, it is the most extraordinary experience that I, that I have been to as far as major events are concerned. Uh, no cell phones on the grounds, and there's a big rule sign when you walk in the gate, and by God, everybody follows the rules. <laughs> Literally. I mean, because they know if they don't, the Pinkerton guards are going to get there and go throw them out. And it literally, so, you know, when you walk the golf course, I mean, it can be, you know, they can have 20,000 people on the golf course, but, but everybody's walking, everybody's respectful. Uh, you can put chairs around the green. They have chairs. You put your business card in the, uh, in the back of the chair, and you can leave, and you, you could put it on 18 early in the morning, like get there 730 in the morning. Nobody touches it. You can walk all day around the golf course, no one will take your seat. Everybody just goes. And so you're really looking forward to the Live Masters, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's truly extraordinary. I mean, you, if, if you can get there, I mean, it's, it's unlike any sporting event that you've ever been to. Thank you for that sidetrack there. <laughs> Good. Yeah, just to finish up, you know, I think I would also like to maybe go see the Cowboys play in the next Super Bowl, wherever that is. And, and I would probably go with my friend Glenn, and maybe if I, I would love to do that. Um, and I'm, again, not big, big on big crowd. I'd also love, as a personal sports person, uh, athlete, is to actually go to Austin and play Austin Country Club once after seeing the Dell match play and, and uh, that course to me. We play golf and I lo love to play golf. I've not been able to get on that course yet. I played the, the Texas golf course, which is great, uh, and others, Barton Creek and all, all those courses. But Austin is a very private club and it's hard to get on. And if we are going to play that, I probably need to get my handicap down 10 or 15 <laughs> strokes. But the last thing, personal bucket list, is uh, just to see my family and my grandkids grow up. I like that. Help. All right, here's just off the cuff here. I just I wrote this down because we've all done this. You're scanning the TV at night. What movie do you come across where you have to watch it again for the 15th time? What is your stop-down movie? Godfather. Godfather. Okay. There's, there's too many. That would certainly, that would certainly be on the list. Um, uh, what was the movie with uh, Clint Eastwood and Gene Hackman? 
the great line. Dirty Harry? No, no, no. It's a Western. Uh, I can't think of the name of it because it's past my bedtime. Make uh, my day? No, the great line where uh, uh, Clint Eastwood is about to kill Gene Hackman, and he's laying on the ground. Unforgiven. Thank you very much. <laughs> He's looking at him, and Gene Hackman looks up at him, and he says, I don't deserve to, to die like this. And Eastwood says, deserves got nothing to do with it. Uh, that one, well, I mean, there's too many. Right. We've used that line on the broadcast now every now and then, haven't we? Yes, yes, we have. Yes, we have. Um, not necessarily on that level, but if, if I happen to come across and see Caddyshack or Animal House, I, I just, I sit there. And I just, I'm watching it, I'm going, this is insane, but it's so entertaining and fun. Uh, so, there you go. I was hoping and, for and a Shawshank to... Redemption. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's yeah. on, on the list. There you go. There you go. That's good. The Great Escape with Steve, Steve McQueen is one of my favorite also. Uh, I have some questions from the audience, if that's okay. And I'm going to read a couple of them. Oh, I, I, it's already pre-recorded. Pre it's very exciting. Um... I guess I'll have to go to you, Brad. Did you see the backwards run there, by the way? She got right down to here. It was and a then immediately walk. went into backpedal. Let's give her a hand, will you please? Because that's not easy. Very nicely done. This is from Logan in Dallas, and he wants to know, Brad, what is your favorite Cowboys moment? I know. Pick one. I, I, always, I always come back to the being on the field – at the Rose Bowl, about three and a half hours before the uh, Super Bowl 27, where they beat the Bills, um, the the moment it was it was almost surreal. You, the, the sky was clear. You have the mountains in the background. There was still dew on the grass, mm -hmm. but you're looking around and you're seeing all of the trappings of the Super Bowl, and you know that's where you are. And it was some, something out of a picture book. And it was, it was because they were playing in that game that I was there. That's actually the thing that comes first to my mind. I, this is just a personal note. It's because, I, again, I follow all you guys, what everything you've done. And a friend was telling me, he says, you got that thing coming up with Brad and Coop and Bobby. I said, yeah. And they said, what's your one moment with Sham that you remember the most? I said, Tony Hill, Tony Hill. That <laughs> Was my favorite moment. Yeah, that was a so that's that is one of mine. If I had five, uh, that's December of 1979. I was doing color with Vern, uh, and he was off doing a boxing tournament for ABC, working with Sugar Ray Leonard. So I'm doing play by play. It's the last game of the year of the regular season against Washington. The winner is going to win the division. The loser is probably going to miss the playoffs, which is what happened. And they had Dorsett was hurt, and uh, they had guys hurt all over the place. Um, and so Washington scored a couple of times real easy. John Riggins went around the end for 66 yards. And for the Cowboys, it was like pulling teeth. It was like sludge. But they stayed close. And this is my favorite play. It's still my favorite play. In the first 44 years, I've had a chance to do Cowboy games. So it's about the two-minute warning. Washington's up by six. And Dallas is out of timeouts. And all Washington's got to do is make a first down. Game's over. They're going to win. And um, they ran a pitch play to Riggins, which I think was the same one he'd run for a touchdown earlier. Larry Cole, one of the smartest players I ever saw, the slowest white man that ever lived, I swear to God. <laughs> and Riggins was a, a, a sprinter, but he was so smart, he diagnosed the play. I actually talked to him about this about a year ago. Uh, he, he recognized by how the center was aligning his hands and shoulders what play he thought was coming. So he Larry takes off on a sprint and... The ball is snapped back, and I guess it was Joe Theismann. He turned around, and he pitched it to Riggins, and Larry's waiting for him. He got the ball. Larry tackled him, about a five- or six-yard loss. They have to punt. Staubach throws to Springs. Staubach throws to Preston Pearson, and that's what got us to, with two seconds left, 
Tony Hill, touchdown, Tony Hill. Yes. And Tony uh, Hill. what I later found out from Roger was that Tom Landry sent in a post pass to the tight end, which they had run against Washington a few weeks before, and it got intercepted. So Tom sends in the play, and Roger gets the play from the messenger guard, and he says, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> and, and he says, he looked at Tony Hill, and he said, if that corner presses you, run a fade. And Lamar Parrish came up on his nose and pressed him, and Tony Hill ran a fade, and Roger just dropped it right, right in the bucket. It's greatness. That's greatness. greatness. All right, uh, Bobby Steinfeld, this is from Ron in Houston. What is Greg Popovich like? Oh, yeah. Well, you have two minutes. Go. <laughs> no, yeah. No, a great story about, you know, Pop. You know, people, there's a misconception of what he's like. You know, the way, he, you know, when you hear him on the air, if you don't ask him an intelligent, proper question, he'll shoot you down, right? But he's also the nicest, he can be the sweetest guy uh, and very loyal, you know, especially to other coaches in the profession that have lost their job. Somehow we would find out they would be doing color for us, you know, and like, so we had some, you know, Bernie Bickerstaff, Steve Kerr would work with us, uh, you know, and other coaches. But, you know, uh, a few years ago, um, I hadn't seen him after I left the Spurs and uh, uh, I was doing the Pelicans game, I, you know, and I hadn't seen him. And, and I knew he was, the Spurs were coming into New Orleans. And I hadn't seen him for like five years, so I said, you know what, I'm going to go back, and they have a little presser outside the locker rooms, and all the media is waiting for him before the game starts, because he knows all that. So I said, you know what, I'm going to leave the truck, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm just going to try to get his attention, maybe, and just say hello to him. His wife had just passed away a few months before that. And, uh, you know, uh, we come, I come, it's about 5.15, and the game starts around 7.30, and all the media is there waiting for him to come out. And the PR guy, Tom James, comes, all right, he's on his way out. And all the cameras are going, the lights are on. And Pop comes out of the locker room, and he sees me, right? And it's like five years. And he comes up to me, and all the media is like, what the hell? He's coming. He goes, Steiny, how are you doing? You know, I, I, I said, how are you doing? He goes, and I said, well, yeah, I hadn't seen you in five years. I'm doing the, the, the Pelicans now. And he goes, no, 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 I don't mean how you are professionally. I mean how you are personally. You know, that's the way he was, you know, and I told him, uh, you know, I say, I, I, you know, I really feel sorry. And I want to tell you how sorry I am that you lost your wife and all that. And he goes, you know, what's so great about being a coach and seeing people like you is that wherever I travel around the nation, I see Monty Williams. I see all my old, old people. So when I travel and I see people I know, it, it's just a blessing to me and see. And then we hugged each other and like. This is being witnessed by all the media. They go, what the hell is going on? So I'm just saying that's the way Pop is, really, once you get to know him. Coop, I, the, this comes from Rachel and Tyler, so I want to give her the credit for the question, but I think we might know this, but I'll ask it anyway. Your favorite Maverick moment? Plant the flag. Right. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the obvious one. I mean, they, you know, you're documenting history. And you don't want to mess it up. And hopefully I got it right. And I think I did get it right. Uh, but, I mean, there, there are so many. I mean, you know, Vince Carter shot against San Antonio in game three in 2014. I mean, th there are so, so many Dirk stories that uh, and I'll, I'll tell one here real briefly. It's, um, it's my first year, and we're in Los Angeles. We play. We play, we play a lousy game. But we score like 75 points. But Dirk hits a shot with a half second to go, and we win. Get on the plane, go to San Francisco. We're playing the next night, and you know when we get to the hotel, you know the we come on the buses and the equipment truck is loaded up and it comes behind us. And when the equipment truck gets to the hotel, you know the iguanas like me uh, and the broadcasters, the trainers, and we all help unload the stuff, and then they they get it all all the bags and whatever they get it organized. Well, on this particular night though, I, I I'm I get a bag, I'm walking around. And who do I see? I see Dirk. And here's Dirk with a bag in his hand. He's slinging bags. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, LeBron's doing this. Kobe, Kobe's doing this, right? 
But here's Dirk. And it, I mean, to me, it was, it's the essence of who he was and, 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 and who he is. He's, uh, he, he is a, the most unassuming superstar that I've ever had the chance to be around. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been extraordinarily lucky that I got, uh, you know, I got the last two thirds of Dirk's career and then I got Luca on top of that. I've not, I've, I've not been in the vast wasteland of really watching bad basketball players play. You know, I've, I've had a star to watch and to chronicle and to, uh, you know, to describe all that time. So I want to check. How are we on time? Everybody got to go to bed yet? Yeah. You're wrap up. Okay. All right. Two more questions and I'm done. What is sports heaven to you? Cubs win the World Series, Cowboys win the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's exactly what I, I, I wrote down Wrigley Field. Oh, that's my happy place. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that is the happiest place in the world. Chuck? Wow. Florida beats my Longhorns? What's that? Florida beats my Longhorns? The, uh, a return to prominence for the Gators. <laughs> would uh, A Gator football team would be nice that we're more, good more than just one year and then win four games the next year. Yeah, that... Um, the, the Mavericks getting good enough again that I can have another one of those moments. And, you know, I have no idea what I'd say or, or how it would come out. But, uh, you know, like Brad said, in, in many, what we do, we're, I mean, we're the most fortunate people in the world because ultimately we, we are describing joy. We are describing your joy, you know, your, your fandom. Uh, and to be able to try to put that into words in that moment, that would be really, really cool if it happens again. All right, Bob. What specifically was the question again? Sports heaven. What is it? To me, um, when I go back to Austin, to me, uh, and I remember – you know, going as a stringer to the UT games and, you know, writing for the Daily Texan, like I told you, and then going to the games, you know, as a, as a fraternity, you know, on, you know with the, as a fan. And now, you know, I'm going back for Fox Sports and I'm actually in the producer's seat and I'm, I'm producing a University of Texas Longhorn game. That makes me, you know, love it. All right, last thing. Tell us about the book and anything else you got going on, and then we'll go to Brad, and then we'll go to Coop. Yeah, well, um, you know, during COVID, there weren't a lot of games to produce, actually zero, right? And it took a while. Even then, when the games started up, they were in the bubble. So, you know, I really wasn't producing games and everything. And then my wife, Sarah, sitting right there, she looks at me and she goes, you know, you're starting to get in my hair. Why don't you write a book or something? <laughs> so I did. So it took me a, a, a few years. And I had been, over the years, you know, keeping a journal of, of events so I don't forget certain big things, which, which I did. And uh, it took me a while. And I, I wrote the book. Uh, and uh, I was going to self-publish it. And it was supposed to come out this, this fall. Well, then I got uh, approached by a, a publisher a, from T TCU Press, and they do sports books, Dan Jenkins, they do PGA. And they said, this is something that we really would like to fast track. And they, they asked me, can we publish your book? And so I had to make a determination whether I wanted to self-publish it, where you maybe you know, reap more of the awards, or go with a publisher. And I asked a lot of different people their opinions. And it just seemed a, a consensus that to have a publisher do it because they're going to distribute it. They're going to pay to get it printed. They're going to help with the artwork. Uh, they're going to have, uh, they're going to distribute it all over the world. They're going to make the E version of it. And it, it plays right up into this region. A lot of stories with Nolan Ryan, um, uh, you know, the Olympics, um, uh, the Rangers, you know, and I produced the Rangers for you know, 15 years, uh, and even got to go out on the field uh, during batting practice with the Rangers, uh, you know, practice jersey. Bobby Valentine would let me go out. That was like living out a dream, you know, catching balls up against the warning track with Larry Parrish and Inky. And it was like when we were at the JCC doing home run derby against the fence, and now I'm doing it with real major leaguers. So that was great. There's stories in there about that. 
but, uh, but it's, it's now going to come out in the fall of 24. And so, you know, more information that will be. How can somebody get the book if they want it? Not yet. Okay. It's and the title right is? It's called 321, which I always say as we're getting ready to come on the air. 321, we're on the air. Subtitle is uh, Inside Stories of Five Decades Producing Sports Television from the NBA and WNBA to Major League Baseball and Olympics. Fantastic. Bradley, I'm sure you got something going on. Anything you want to promote a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'm going to take a nap. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to Wrigley Field for six games in July. At a boy. And then I'm going to training camp. And then Oxnard in July. Yeah. I'll see you out there. Chuck? Uh, a lot more golf than I've really played in a long time. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, things, Nirvana, uh, around it. Around at Augusta might uh, might get that done. If anybody can help me on that, I'd appreciate it. Um, uh, but uh, it really, just actually trying to uh, travel the state and play some courses that I've never played before. Um, we're going to uh, probably travel west and get into the mountains in August before it gets uh, too too crazy. Um, and uh, really, it's 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 a very quiet summer. Unfortunately, it's a long summer. You know, if you, you make the playoffs, and even if you lose in the first round, you know, there's that extra two weeks that you're working, let alone that the money that you're going to make for the extra games. Uh, I mean, we've been, we've been out now nine and a half weeks, and, hey. it, and it feels like nine and a half months. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't wait to get back to work. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll do the draft next week and, uh, you know, keep tabs on free agency, whatever we do there. But uh, really, it's a, it's, a, it's a quiet summer, which is, which is okay, which is really okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to be here with these guys. Robert Steinfeld, Brad Sham, Chuck Cooperstein. We thank you so much for your time and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. If you all will hold on just a minute. I know it's getting late, but first of all, I want to thank these guys so much. Robert, Brad, Chuck, my dear friend, Elf, here for giving up their time this evening to entertain us, and I'm sure we could all probably ask a thousand more questions. I have, uh, I'm Rhonda Duchin. I am the first vice president for uh, this coming year, and I have a little gift to give each of these guys. <laughs> and maybe in a couple years there will be part of this, the Pioneer Jewish Texans. So each one of you, please take one and pass it down. And last but not least, y'all heard amazing things about what this organization is doing. Please think about becoming a member. Whoa. Think about doing your oral history. It really is something that is a legacy for you, your family, and for Dallas Jewish community. Thank you and good night. How are you? Hi, nice to meet you. Okay. I don't know. Maybe another year.